and reverence to our God who joins us in the reading of his holy word. I invite you to stand as you're able. The Holy Gospel according to the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there. Say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off and protest against you. You know this. The kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See how I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over the power of all the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to begin by thanking you for this honor and privilege of joining you in worship. It's always good to be with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and this is an exceptional place. Friendly people, beautiful music, and just the spirit of uh, God present in all that happens. I want to begin also with a confession and telling you that uh, anytime I'm in a new place, there are things that I've done for years and years, and they're very comfortable and familiar, and I can do them you know, pretty much by memory. But this is a new place with new uh, practices and traditions. And so it's like the old saying goes, if you're watching your feet, you're not dancing, you're learning to dance, okay? I'm watching my feet and my timing and other things, and I'll try to get as much of it right as I can and trust God to do the rest. I want to begin this morning by just thinking about this time in history. Tomorrow is the 246th birthday of our nation. Last week when I was here with you sitting out there and not up here, I heard Pastor Paul talk about his pending transition after spending his uh, nearly seven years with you and what he foresaw God doing next. You look at the news, you know, you listen to what people have to say, and there's a spirit that says things aren't going well. And I want to bring you a message that is unique to this time and this place. And I want to begin by bringing up a Bible verse that I think sums it up so well. It's from the lesson that was read earlier in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 28. And it simply reads as this. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I have found in my life personally and even in the congregations I've served that Sometimes we can read too much, which means we gloss over the little important details. Look at that first phrase. We know that in all things, God works for good. It does not say that all things are good. It doesn't say that they're going to change immediately. But what it says very clearly, very powerfully, and I think we all need to hear it in light of the things I've mentioned and things that I haven't, Everything going on in the world, God will use for his good and yours and his kingdom. It may take us a while to see it. We may not notice it. But you can trust that. There's a phrase some of you might have heard. It can obviously be trivialized and lose its meaning. 
but it goes like this. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Whenever you start to doubt that, when you read the news or listen to what's going on, repeat that phrase. You know, what is it like your shampoo? You know, shather, rinse, re- sh- uh, lather, rinse, repeat. Repeat it. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. And that includes absolutely everything. I hope you can get that personally as you hear that message again this morning. To introduce that, I might go back to one of the most beloved and well-known stories in the Bible. You don't have to answer out loud. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Who told Mary and Joseph to go to Bethlehem in the nativity story? I've asked people that in you know, private settings, Bible studies. It's amazing how many people say an angel or Gabriel or some you know, godly thing. No. The Bible is very clear. In those days, Caesar Augustus sent out a decree, Mary and Joseph, you've got to go to Bethlehem. Do you realize what that means? That would be the equivalent of having a decree come out from Vladimir Putin telling you you had to do something. You wanted me to what? They did not like Caesar Augustus. They cared nothing for him. And yet even in Mary, even Mary and Joseph, Mary, you know, great with child, as the scripture would tell us, they not only had to go, they had to do it while she is pregnant. And I don't know that she had a donkey, but even if she did, I can't imagine this much better than walking, okay? I mean, it would be bad enough without the pregnancy, but here at the worst time, from the worst person, God is working for good. He's bringing the Savior of the world to Bethlehem, and he needs to get Mary and Joseph there, and he uses Caesar Augustus. Good Friday the same way. You can't imagine a worse day in the history of the world than Good Friday when the authorities of that day, the people in power, whether government or religious, they put to death an innocent human being, the Son of God. God used that for his good purposes. I don't know what's going on in your life. Personally, we know what's going on in the world. We know what's going on in this country. There's a war in Ukraine, all kinds of problems in this country. You as a congregation are going to have to make a transition that you might have rather not done. And then you've got all your personal stuff on top of that. God will use absolutely every bit of your life, your history, and make it work for good. In fact, as I reflect back on my life, and I encourage others to think the same way, start looking for the times in your life, now that you can look back on it, and you can say, the worst thing that ever happened to me was the best thing that ever happened to me. That's not easy. I'm not saying it's trivial, but others have done it before us. The young man, you know, Joseph with the coat of many colors, what did he spend? About 22 years as a slave, separated from family, far country. God used it for good. In fact, he tells his brothers when they get reunited, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Boy, do we need to hear those words. The world might mean it for evil. It hurts, it's painful, but God will use it for good. Why is that? Well, part of the reason is, and this next slide should help you out, only the eyes of faith can discern what God is doing. I think that image of the iceberg, for me, represents so much of our own lives in a visual format, which I happen to do better uh, when I can see it. Scientists will tell us that maybe a tenth of an iceberg is above the water. Ninety percent, nine-tenths of an iceberg you can't see. You couldn't tell if you were in a boat or a ship or whatever. You don't know what's below the water. You can't see it without an image like this. You and I only see a little glimpse of what God is doing in the world because so much of it is hidden unless you have the eyes of faith. In fact, you might have heard somebody say, you might have said it yourself, I don't know what God is doing. Where's God? I can't see why this is happening. I can't see why. Well, of course you can't see it. It would take the eyes of faith. And we don't have it. That has to be given to us by God. What did the lesson that was read for you today, what did the words of Scripture say? If you hope in what is seen, that's not hope. That's sight. 
Our challenge is to trust and hope in that which we cannot see, but you can trust the reality God is good all the time. All the time. We may not even be good. Loved ones may fail us. Governments may fail us. The world is certainly not always doing God's will. But that won't stop God. He's in the midst of it. Once you start thinking about that, and I'm going to share with you a story from my life. Now, it's, I won't say yours is like mine, but I think it might help you start looking at when and how has God been active in the past, and that's probably how he'll be present in the future. I don't know if my story is even close to yours, but I go back. I was baptized at a couple weeks old in a small rural church, and uh, I never met the pastor that baptized me. I saw his picture on the wall in the basement. You know, they had confirmation classes and other pictures, and there was the pastor. I have no recollection of time with him. I grew up, thanks to loving parents and committed parents and youth workers and volunteers in the church, like the ones they're recruiting for Bible school. Uh, I grew up a person of faith, and I knew I wanted to go into the ministry, so I go to seminary. My first church is in California. I love it out there. There's mountains. You know, I could drive three hours to the beach. I could drive two hours to Mount Whitney, the tallest, coldest place in the United States. I could drive two hours to Death Valley, the opposite. I could pick a climate and be there in three hours. We built a new sanctuary. Everybody was about my age. They were all young engineers at a Navy base. It was ideal. And then my father was in a bad car accident, broke his back. And neither of our parents traveled. The kids were growing up and didn't know their cousins or their grandparents. I get a call from a church in Nebraska, a small rural church like the town I grew up in, and they wanted to know if I'd be interested in being their pastor. And I thought, hmm, I could go visit my parents if I went back for an interview. So I said, sure, I'll do that. I mean, what are the chances? Here I am in California, and I have a full beard, and I have an afro. In those days, I had long, curly hair. And uh, I'm thinking, what are the chances that this small rural town in Nebraska is going to call a guy that looks like me? I can go visit my parents, come back and do what I've been doing and what I love doing. Well, I go there, and I don't meet with the call committee. They fill the fellowship hall with members of the congregation who want to know who the next pastor might be. And they're unanimous. They want me to come. I knew that night I went home and that we didn't have cell phones in the days. I called my wife and said, I think they're going to call me and I may have to go. We go back to California. Sure enough, they send me a letter of call. We call a family meeting, if you want to call it that. My wife and I and our two kids, second, in, second grade in kindergarten, sit on our bed and we took a vote. And the vote was three to one to go. I was the one. I didn't really want to go, but we go, and I get to this little town, and the church secretary is the daughter of the pastor that baptized me. I get to know her, I get to know her kids, which are the grandchildren of the pastor that baptized me. I have them in my confirmation programs, my youth programs. I'm there five years, and many of them had um, uh, children. Uh, in a church in Lincoln, Nebraska. So after five years there, I get a call to go to Lincoln, Nebraska. But before that, when I first got to Syracuse, I had lined up the, um, a chance to spend a month at Holden Village, a Christian retreat center. But I was supposed to go in June, and before I even got to Syracuse from California, I found out that the interim pastor had scheduled all the weddings for the summer, the whole summer, obviously in the month of June, and he was going to do all four of them. And I said, no, you're not. I'm going to do those. I want to get to know the families. I want to be a part of that happy occasion. So I called Holden Village and said, can I change my uh, schedule? Yeah. So I changed my schedule, moved it back a year, went in um, 1983 instead of 82. And while I'm at the camp, a church group from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, spends a week at the camp. And in that group is the son of the pastor that baptized me. Now, if I'd have gone a year earlier as planned, I'd never met him. But I meet this young man, spend a week with him at the camp because we find out this connection. Oh, I know your dad. Uh, or I knew of your dad. I know your sister. Then I end up going to Lincoln, Nebraska after five years in Syracuse. And in that congregation is the pastor that baptized me. 
Now, I didn't realize all this at the time, but it's, as I look back on life, I say, wow, God knows how to play chess, right? How do you move all these pieces? So I touch every member of that family. I'm there about two or three years, and then the young man I met from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, he dies in his 40s. And I do the funeral for a grieving father, mother, and sister, but I know everybody in the family. And as I look back at that from the vantage point of just probably 10 years ago at the most, I said, wow. A lot of things happened in my life, like my father's accident and some other things that I didn't really like, and God used all of them for his purposes. Yeah, we were blessed in the process, but so were the other members of that family and the congregations I served in the meantime. So as I heard Pastor Paul talk last week about what God was doing in his life, I want you to know it isn't just pastors that God is caring for and using, it's all of us. And I just pray that somehow by the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit, you'd see a few of those and say, oh, that's what God was doing. Some of the worst things that have happened in my life have turned out to be the best things that happened. And I just pray that you have experienced some of that because other people need to hear it from you. I found that interesting, you see, and I don't think there's such thing as coincidence when you're dealing with God's spirit. So you've been for a few weeks now, I know the last couple in particular, you've been talking about the Great Commission. We just sang about it in that beautiful song. But I think we need to connect the Great Commission with the Great Commandment. What's the great commandment? You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Great commandment. That's the wow part. Wow. God loves me that much. God loves the world that much. I don't think there's a lot of wow in the world about God really loves me. Somebody asked when you talk about the things we suffer through, Somebody, you know, they were thinking about the passion of Christ on the cross, and somebody said, how long do you suppose Jesus suffered on the cross? And I had another mentor in my life say, hey, if you came from heaven to earth, every moment would be suffering. It wasn't just the hours on the cross, every moment, but he did that for you and me. Wow. We have a God that loves us that much. You see, when you have the great commandment and you fall in love with that God, the great commission, which is to go and make disciples, isn't so scary. Can't you just imagine those early disciples as Jesus is sending them out? Maybe you had the same thought. I want you to go and make disciples. I want you to go tell a message that's, that the kingdom of God is at hand. I can just hear the disciples saying, I'm not a good public speaker. I, that's not really for me. I think there are two kinds of people in the world, particularly when they're trying to represent their faith. And hopefully this has happened to you, but I've had it now that I'm retired. I can go to a church and I can tell the difference between, there are some pastors that have to say something because it's 10 o'clock. There are other pastors that have something to say. Did you catch the little difference? There's a huge difference between having to say something religious in fact, I usually know if they start out with the dictionary definition or what somebody else says, eh, they got to say something. I'm looking for people that have something to say. You have friends, you have family, you have coworkers, you have strangers in your life that need to know what God has to say. They need to hear about the God who cares about them. And what they really need to know is kind of summarized in a hymn that you could probably easily finish. I'm sure it's beloved here as it is many places. Have you ever heard the hymn, How Great Thou Art? You know how that begins? Oh, Lord, my God, what comes next? When I in awesome wonder. We need some awesome wonder, and it's in the scriptures. Everything about the scriptures, including the bad stuff, Let's us see the awesome wonder. Wow, that's the God who loves me. This is the God that I serve. I got something to tell other people. And what are we going to tell them? Well, John Newton summed it up pretty well in another hymn that we love, Amazing Grace. What does it say in that hymn? I once was lost, 
now I'm found. I was once blind, now I see. Nobody can argue with that. They won't argue with that. So when we go out and we, want, we share with somebody, I've got something I'd like to share with you. And you tell them, this is what God has done in my life. If you're hurting, if you're broken, and who can say no to that? I think everybody I know would say that. I've got something to share with you. Now here's what else we need to share. Next image I'd put up. God knows and wants what's best for us. Chew on that for a while. God knows what's best for us. We'd be glad to argue with him a lot of times. I don't think that's for me. Wait it out. And he also knows and wants for us what's best. That's true for everybody, whether they know Jesus or not. In fact, a way to illustrate it is another image that I like images, if you think about uh, the difference between a caterpillar and butterfly. It's the same creature. It's the same creature, creation of God. One of them is fat and roly-poly, and if I got one on me, I'd flick it off and who knows, probably step on it. But if I had a butterfly land on me, it's kind of, that's cool. When we're born into sin, we're like a caterpillar. That means bad, it just means that's what we are. But that isn't what God intended for a caterpillar. God intends to turn that caterpillar into a butterfly. God intends to turn you into sons and daughters in his kingdom with all the rights and privileges and blessings. And we lose sight of that. I think there are people that, you know, could you just give me a pair of wings and I'll stay a caterpillar? You can't teach a caterpillar to fly. It won't work. There are some people that think, well, if I could just try harder. No. You need to let God change you from the inside out. I'm sure in today's world, somebody write a book about saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with being a caterpillar your whole life. That's not what God intended. St. Paul, who's been through all, everything we can talk about. I mean, you talk about a God or a guy that writes about in all things. He's talking shipwrecks. He's talking beatings. He's talking torture, persecution, all that kind of stuff. He still says, no, and all that, God was working for good. Never intended for a caterpillar to stay a caterpillar. A butterfly is one of the early Christian symbols of the resurrection. God wants to work in you, that new creation. There's no way a caterpillar is going to fly. For a butterfly, it's easy. I just talked to a friend of mine the other day and said, how can I forgive somebody who's done such evil stuff to me? I said, you can't. Caterpillars can't fly. Our sinful nature can't forgive, can't get over the hurts in the past. Butterflies can fly. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. They're able to do things they had never done before. St. Paul says, look at my life. This is what I once was. This is what I am now. We dare not leave people to their own devices. They won't figure this out on their own. The reason Jesus sent out his disciples two by two, the reason he gave the Great Commission is, if you don't tell them, they'll die caterpillars. They won't figure it out. It's impossible. When I think about how foolish it is, and I, it, it surprises me how foolish people can be when it comes to scripture. There are so many people that maybe started off, they grew up in the church, they went to church for a while, something bad happened one or more times, they ask the question, where was God? And when they don't get the answer they want because they're only looking at 10% of what's been going on, they think they're done. It reminds me of the fictional story, and this is indeed fictional. You know, some people don't know how to study unless somebody teaches them. In the book of Acts, there's a story between uh, Philip and an Ethiopian, highly educated, second in command to the queen of Ethiopia. He's reading the Bible but doesn't understand it. it reminds me of the person that took a Bible, you know, finally desperate, dropped it, flopped it open, put his finger down, thinking, well, I'll see what the word of God says. And the Bible is pretty good. You could probably do that a lot of times and get away with it. This guy wasn't so lucky. 
he dropped his Bible that opened to put his finger down, he ended up with Matthew 27, verse 5, which reads as follows, and Judas went out and hung himself. Whoops. That didn't work. I'll try one more time. Luke 10, 37. The chapter we read from today, towards the end of the chapter, the story of the Good Samaritan, after it's all done, puts his finger down, go and do likewise. Do you see the problem here? Judas hung himself, go and do likewise. That's about as crazy as people get unless there's somebody like you, a family member, a friend that says, uh, no, God is good all the time. All the time God is good. Let's look at what God has done in your life, what he wants for you, and see if that doesn't make more sense. So how do we live into that? How do we get excited about that? How do we make sure that we've always got something to say rather than having to say something. Now, I look around the room. We've got parents and grandparents, maybe some great-grandparents. And uh, now that I'm in the grandparent age myself, how hard would you have to beg me to show you pictures and tell you stories about my grandkids? You know, you better move on after two or three minutes or it's going to happen. Why are we not that way about our God? Wait till I tell you what God did late and last. Here's, here's what God did most recently. People will listen if you've got something to say, they're not interested in having you say something. I want to give you a little reminder of something that's going to happen twice a day. So when you think about we're called Great Commandment, Great Commission, I'll give you a picture of the clock that's in my bedroom. Look where it's set, 828, Romans 828. Twice a day, you'd be surprised if you've got a clock on your microwave, wherever, particularly a digital clock. You'll be surprised in a week's time how many times you just happen to look at the clock and this is 828. That's God telling you what? I'm working for good in your life all the time. Trust me. It won't happen quickly. Trust me. 828. Would you join me in prayer? Oh God, we give you thanks for your life-giving word. Lord, if we're not caught up in awe and wonder at your birth, at your victory over death in the grave, at your love for us, at your will for us, and for not only this life, but for all eternity, we haven't yet heard the story. Lord, let us hear it, and then let us tell it with passion and enthusiasm, and I pray this in your name. Amen.